the southern border situation is a, at a point of lawlessness that goes beyond what it's ever been in the past. And this is just the, the illegal part. We can talk about the legal part as well. But the southern border, I, there are so many people I talk to, including conservatives, who think that the problem with the southern border is that the Biden administration is just not doing a good enough job preventing people from crossing. And they're the kind of people who think, you know, if only we had drones on the border, and then, then we could solve because they would find them and then we yeah. could stop them. If only we had a more smart personnel. Border. That's yeah. right. That's right. But that's not the problem. The problem is the Biden administration is facilitating illegal immigration. And, and in fact, even has that, that CBP-1 app on your you can get on your phone, you download it, and you can schedule your illegal entry. Right, you don't have a visa, but you can schedule it. You can show up there, and they say, "Okay, uh, you know, are you, are you here for a humanitarian reason?" Okay, well, come on in. Uh, that's the situation we're in right now, and t to me, I mean, I don't think it's an exaggeration to say that it really does threaten our democracy. I mean, we hear that phrase a lot, but if you're going to so fundamentally change the United States without legal legal authorization, then that really is a blow to what we call representative government. Howdy, everyone, and welcome back to Moment of Truth, the podcast of American Moment. My name is Saurabh Sharma. I'm the president of American Moment. And this week, it's just me for a very special episode, one that I can't help but feel a little morally righteous for hosting. Um, for those of you who don't know, DC used to be a lot worse. Um, we made a lot of progress on the right of center in being uh, a little bit stiffer spined uh, and a little bit more contemplative about how quickly we decide to acquiesce to whatever the left is telling us to do at any point in time. And one of the people who unfortunately experienced the worst excesses of the conservative movement's weaknesses was Jason Richwine, who today is a resident scholar at the Center for Immigration Studies, but once upon a time was part of Con Inc., quote unquote. And he was steamrolled by the media um, and institutions that failed him when his dissertation from college, uh, which was approved by a Harvard committee of professors, uh, was brought up during the course of the 2013 fights over the Gang of Eight bill. And he was fired from the Heritage Foundation um, and basically had no institutional affiliations in Washington for half a decade until after the Trump administration brought him in. And now he he's back at the Center for Immigration Studies. His story is a fascinating one, and it's one that he tells very convincingly. Jason's not bitter. He's not jealous. Um, but he's a cautionary tale of just how bad groupthink in D.C. can get and He's a great asset to our movement. He's one of the most talented social scientists that we have. And on that issue of immigration, he is the only game in town as far as I'm concerned. American Moment's third priority reads, immigration must be restricted in order to promote cultural solidarity and the economic well-being of all Americans. We spent a lot of time with Warren Cass a couple of weeks ago talking about the economic consequences of migration and what it means to have a mass increase in the supply of labor. Today, we spent a lot of time with Jason talking about culture and just how rigorous the science seems to be that assimilation in the popular understanding of the term where people just become as American as apple pie and there's no way to delineate them um, from the rest of the population just isn't actually the case. I want to have uh, one of the people he cites frequently, uh, Garrett Jones, on soon to talk more in depth about this because he wrote a book about it. But Jason gives us a very good primer on just how specific and and honest the social science is about the fact that immigration has consequences for a nation's culture and what those consequences might be. We had a fantastic discussion. I highly, highly encourage you to watch it to the end and send us some feedback. Uh, if you're really mad at me, uh, email Nick. Um, but if you'd like to send some positive feedback, send me a note. Uh, Sarab at American Moment is my email. Uh, few enough of you listen to this that I feel comfortable sharing that. We'll go now to Jason Richwine, resident scholar at the Center for Immigration Studies and one of the most talented thinkers on immigration that we have today. How 
Howdy, Jason. Thank you for coming on the podcast. It's great to be here, Saram. Uh, it's a long time coming. Uh, we've been excited to have you uh, for a long time, mostly because you have this sort of mythic story in Washington, D.C. That, that I sort of heard about, you know, told uh, through the oral tradition for many years. Uh, why don't you tell us your story? How did you end up uh, being involved in the research uh, that you are today, where you are today, and maybe some of the hiccups in the road? Well, um, I did a PhD in public policy at Harvard, and I got a great fellowship in my fourth year to come to AEI, American Enterprise Institute. And uh, the uh, person I was going to be working with there was Charles Murray. And so it was a great deal and I was really happy about it. And I got to do the dissertation. And uh, after that fellowship was over, I moved over to the Heritage Foundation. And um, I would say that the first three years or so of Heritage were sort of like my glory days. You know, I my wife and I had just bought uh, our first house. We had two kids under the age of three and my career was taking shape and, you know, things were really going well. But then my final week at Heritage was not so great. And I think I think that's what you're referring to <laughs> when you say hiccups. Um, the, the basic story is, is is well known. So what happened was, if you remember in 2013, Marco Rubio teamed up with Chuck Schumer um, to pass uh, or to attempt to pass a big uh, comprehensive immigration reform amnesty. It was a Schumer Rubio amnesty. And it was sort of well known that Heritage was the only organization, the major organization that was going to be opposed to this. There's a lot of report, support among Republicans. Rubio's involvement made it kind of seem like this is the new generation of pro immigration Republicans. And they were gunning for us even before we put out our report on the costs of illegal immigration. And so when the report came out, the first author was Robert Rector, who I'm sure you're familiar with, is a longtime uh, heritage scholar. And I was the second author on the paper. And I see, let's see, I think it came out on a Monday. And then it was everywhere. I mean, I, I, I thought before that that I had occasionally gotten some decent media attention for my work. I've never gotten that level. Before. And what was this report? The report was on the costs of amnesty. Basically, how much do uh, illegal immigrant households cost right now and how much would they cost after an amnesty? And it's a lot of money, mainly because they become eligible for things like Social Security and Medicare. So it's down the line. That was one of the issues that we had was, you know, immediately there's not that much cost. In fact, they even built that into the the uh, the bill where they would say, OK, for the first 10 years or so, you're not going to be eligible for any programs, which just happens to be the CBO uh, length of time that they analyze. But anyway, that was the paper. Pretty straightforward. You know, we, we had put a number on it. It was in the trillions in terms of the long term cost of this. The pro-immigration side was very upset about this. They looked around for how to attack it. And everybody knew who Robert Rector was. Okay, but uh, not a lot of people knew who Jason Richwine was. And so they started looking into who this mysterious figure might be. And it was not difficult at all to find what I had written in my dissertation because it was public knowledge to everyone. I like how people say yeah, it's been revealed. With dissertation. <laughs> well, you mean that thing that's like, you know, online already. Yeah. Um, and so the dissertation was about immigration and IQ. And that's why I was working with Charles Murray on it. I had read The Bell Curve in college and I really liked it a lot. I, I mentioned that once to a reporter and then like someone, there's this like Twitter outbreak of like, you know, anyone who thinks Charles Murray is a hero, you know, in college is clearly something wrong with him mentally. <laughs> <laughs> but I was really interested in that. And I was also really interested in immigration. So I thought, why not combine them? That really was the extent of it. I wasn't thinking, well, you know, someday I'm going to be working at a policy think tank and it's going to be a problem. You don't think that. You also, also, you're at Harvard, presumably the like um, the appropriateness filters at Harvard were going to be the most restrictive of any institution you'd be at. This is a big liberal college. Well, you would think so. Yeah. Uh, and, and you would think that the purpose of conservative think tanks is to be sort of a, a home for conservative scholars who may not feel welcome at a place like that. But the PhD program is kind of insular. I, I can only speak for the public policy program there. You know, you just kind of go and do your thing. You, you know, you talk with your advisor and you recruit a couple other committee members. And it, it's not as if you're running it by a Washington Post reporter mm -hmm. before you tackle and I, your and topic. Assume, assume you had like liberal 
dissertation reviewers, right? I had, I think, one of the most politically balanced committees you could imagine. Mm -hmm. um, George Borjas was the uh, was the primary advisor, and he's known as somewhat uh, right of center. Uh, Richard Zeckhauser was kind of a centrist, and then Christopher Jenks, sort of a famous uh, sociologist who was on the left. Uh, those were the three. And then Charles Murray was sort of unofficially as a fourth advisor, a libertarian. I don't think that anyone gets a more balanced political, politically panel than I had. Um, and it, you know, it it uh, it passed muster with them. Um, and uh, and what was the gist of the scholarship? Well, the the main point of it was, since this is a public policy degree, the thought was, well, you know, should we have smart immigrants, right? And what would the impact be of selecting on the basis of intelligence as opposed to things like education? And the idea being that, you know, you can find some smart people who may not have access to education in their home countries, but if they come here, we can kind of, you know, take advantage of their raw potential. And a lot of the, the data aspects of it was looking at the current IQ levels of immigrants in the country and then seeing how uh, those scores might converge or not. And the big thing that the media really picked up on, which was not the main thrust of the, of the dissertation, but was in there, was the issue of um, the cognitive scores from people from Latin America, which were, were lower and were not converging over time uh, based on the data I looked at and also a lot of secondary sources, which I was able to cite. This is to say that the sort of intergenerational process of assimilation was not, uh, you know, closing that gap entirely between, right. say, the native population of the United States and, and the populations of Hispanic immigrants. That's right. And you would think that, that would be something that would be quite important and something that policymakers would be concerned about. Mm -hmm. And I was too. Uh, and that was part of the dissertation. Especially and, in a public policy environment where disparities between groups are seen as prima facie evidence of discrimination and policy matters to be addressed unto themselves. If that if that's not the case, then like, you know, we should have a different public policy approach. So it well, matters. Yes. I mean, we, we could get into that topic, which is which is a deep one. But yes, absolutely. The idea that you take two particular groups, find a socioeconomic disparity between them and then assume the higher one must be oppressing the lower one. That is frankly a poisonous idea and it's affected a lot of our institutions. Mm -hmm. But at any rate, uh, the dissertation, again, passed. It was fine. It was public. Everybody knew about it. Uh, but uh, a Washington Post reporter thought it was this really great news that he could report on this. And he picked out the quotes that were sort of you know, least workshopped, you could say. <laughs> because again, I'm not writing for the Post, I'm just writing for an academic audience. And uh, within 36 hours, I was out of a job. It was a uh, very tough time, very tough. How'd that go down exactly? Well, um, I would say that uh, in the initial hours, it seemed like it could blow over, uh, but it just, seemed like it kept getting worse. It kept snowballing. You know, it was every single media outlet wanted to pick up on it. And this was the story. I mean, we had had a, cu a couple of days where our report was the story. And I had done so much media on, on that question. And now suddenly I was the story. And that was difficult. It, it was very difficult. And when it was over, which was very abrupt, um, I think a lot of people don't appreciate what comes in the immediate aftermath of that because the fear factor among other people is sort of off the charts it, it's that you know i was a witch and i was burned right for it but everyone around me looks at it and says i don't want to be the next witch to be burned you know and so i had made maybe a mistake i guess in thinking or in in, in shaping my social life in a way that overlaps a lot with my professional life. And so suddenly those circles just kind of, you know, ran away. And that was tough. I mean, you, you know, you, you don't get over that except with time, mm -hmm. you know, you don't. And I, I've refrained from talking about it for the most part because I don't necessarily want to be known for it. You know, I, I would rather be known for writing great pieces for National Review or something, mm -hmm. but I think it is instructive in a way. Uh, I, I think it's important for people to know how all this stuff goes down. And I would also say it's important to understand the broader failure of the conservative movement in DC at this time. I'm not saying things might be better now, but at that time, this is not just a heritage foundation and its president Jim DeMint issue. 
Okay, it was also an AEI issue. Remember, AEI brought me there initially to do the dissertation. I had the whole outline and there was nothing surprising in there. I wrote the dissertation mm -hmm. that I promised I would write. And yet when this media firestorm started, AEI could not bring itself to defend me. You know, they, they spoke to reporters in the most uh, careful of ways, just to say, yes, he worked here. What's your opinion on, on the topic? Oh, we don't take any opinions on, uh, you know, but no opinions on this kind of thing. That was hard. And actually, I had been working with another AEI scholar, Andrew Biggs, on a uh, paper on state and local pay comparisons, totally unrelated to immigration. And it was going to be this big paper that was going to be coming out soon. For a time, AEI actually forbid Andrew from writing with me. Uh, it was just, no, you can't publish that paper with his name on it. Eventually, they did relent. But another example, take uh, Manhattan Institute. Okay, I had been contributing to something called the Public Sector Inc. blog. Okay, again, nothing to do with immigration. And after the firestorm, I had something else to say about, you know, public pensions or whatever. And I was able beforehand to just kind of go in there and post my own thing. Right. And so I did. And within a few hours, it was taken down. And I got an email from someone there in Manhattan saying, sorry, you know, you can't contribute here anymore. And the excuse was like, well, you know, you're not, you don't have an institutional affiliation. So we only take people with an institutional affiliation. You know, that's the kind of thing that they do. Um, and so this is sort of across the board, a feeling like we just need to isolate ourselves from this guy. Uh, that was tough. You know, I, I, I am naturally naive, I admit. Um, and for the longest time, I thought that employment is right around the corner. You know, I thought, well, this will blow over in a few weeks. Um, it was not. <laughs> so um, some trying times, definitely. Um, thinking through those days, uh, who were some people that were there for you? Who, 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 who ended up being those friends who, you know, weren't just there through through thick, but also through thin <laughs> or, or whichever <laughs> way that goes? Um, who, who, who do you think actually did? sort of cover, this up and cover themselves in glory in that moment in time. Well, you know, the old joke about I'm finding out who my friends are and I didn't want to know. Yeah. Uh, that, that's that's the truth of it. Yeah. Uh, um, there were a, a lot of behind the scenes things, for which I'm very appreciative. Mm -hmm. Let me be clear about that. Um, and there were a lot of people who did not know me who wrote pieces defending me, which again, I'm very grateful for. I have a list of that on my mm -hmm. website still. Uh, Michelle Malkin was out there right away. Mm -hmm. I mean, like impressively. So, um, however, in terms of people who had a professional relationship with me, the number who publicly defended me, I believe, and I apologize if, I'm, if I've missed someone, I believe is one. Uh, it was Charles Murray uh, who, who wrote a piece defending me, uh, even though he was connected to me very clearly mm -hmm. because he had been an advisor on the dissertation. Uh, no one else did. And, you know, I'm not sure what to think about that. I mean, I understand their fear. You know, it's a very dangerous time out there. But um, that, that's what happened. So you spent some time out in the wilderness. What was mm -hmm. the next thing that you did? I was able, fortunately, to get some anonymous consulting work. Mm -hmm. um, and that kept me afloat. But again, I'm very naive. I'm still naive. Yeah, I'm, I'm naively <laughs> optimistic. Uh, and I thought, again, employment's right around the corner. So what I did was I did about half-time consulting after a while. Um, and I spent the other half of the time looking for work. Mm -hmm. Okay. And boy, did I look for work. I mean, I covered every possible employer, you know, in the DC area in like a 25 mile radius. Mm -hmm. uh, and there, there, of course, there were no bites. Um, eventually, let's see, this was, so that was 2013. Yeah, the, pretty much all of my 2014 was that. Mm -hmm. So it was 20, May of 2013 when the firestorm hit. And you just bought a house, you had a wife and kids, yes. young kids. Yes. And so what I did was, because I was working half time, I covered the remainder with my savings. So by the end of 2014, I had no savings left, uh, non-retirement savings. And I realized, okay, I've got to do something else here. This is not working. Um, and so I, I needed to do the consulting full time at least. And it was right around that time that one of my projects that I had been doing um, as a consultant was for Center for Immigration Studies. Mm -hmm. And it was right around that time um, that frankly, I was getting desperate, I have to admit, uh, where they said, well, why not just consult first full time, you know? And that was really a, a, a lifesaver, I think. Mm -hmm. And that eventually turned into open employment. It took a little while. You know, at first it was like we had to pretend it wasn't me who was writing it, you know? Uh, but, uh, you know, that 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 worked out. And um, 
eventually, uh, as I said, I, you know, I'm now a resident scholar at CIS, so that's a good thing. Trump administration came around. Immigration was the overarching theme of uh, President Trump's mm -hmm. campaign, in addition to trade and foreign policy. Um, feels like your your moment should have come at that point. What were the Trump years like? Well, it, 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 it came three years later. I mean, yes, that was frustrating because when he won, I mean, I was giddy about that. And I thought to myself, you know, you know, now it's like people like me who are on the in, right? I mean, it's like <laughs> it's like the establishment heritage people. You know, sorry, you know, you weren't really involved, right? Uh, but you know, they moved in right away. It was amazing. And, and Trump, I don't think, has the the focus and the organizational skills to to head off something like that. Mm -hmm. It was only until his fourth year when he was finally convinced to get the Never Trumpers out of the White House Presidential Personnel Office, which was a big problem. Uh, and he did. And once he did, once he had allies in there, then they they really uh, tried to get me something and. Took a little while, uh, but uh, near the end, I did become the deputy director of NIST, National Institute of Standards and Technology, and I am uh, very appreciative for that opportunity. And I got the sense too that even though I wasn't there very long, that if we had longer and we were able to put the right people in place, you know, we could do some really good things. Not necessarily just at NIST, but I mean in general in the Department of Commerce and in the White House. And so I am really excited about the next. Republican administration, if we can get the personnel in there who we need. Um, so at that point, um, I felt like I was back in a sense, you know, although, you know, the, the, some people in this were not happy about it at all. Yeah. What was that like? Um, what was your first day like at NIST? Well, keep, <laughs> right. So, so how did that happen? But wh why NIST? What does NIST do for, for anyone who might not be aware? And, and what was the value add that you were bringing? Well, it's formerly Bureau of Standards, right? So it's, uh, you know, the this most official thing that it does is, is, is maintain, you know, uh, weights uh, and measures. Yes. Weights and measures. It's right in the constitution, but it also does a lot of other rich sort of original science work. And they have some really impressive labs mm -hmm. and such there. Uh, and they also, they, they maintain like what the the platonic ideal of of, uh, of a pen or a uh, porridge or you know or or or, or, or a, you know an apple is well whatever. they worked on like the treaty of the meter right because yeah. you have to international treaty on what a meter is yeah. and of course they have the atomic clock and uh but uh what was i gonna say yeah so yeah they maintain like the standard kilogram weight the standard mm -hmm. like pound weight and all that stuff which are like specific objects right uh, yes. So uh, they also advocate for uh, sort of sci investments in science and policy mm. and such. Um, I, I could see myself actually enjoying that if I had a longer time to, to do it. Uh, but put yourself in my shoes here, right? So <laughs> so it's NIST. I mean, I didn't have a, let's just say I didn't have a strong familiarity with it before they invited me yeah. to, to be there. And so I'm sort of like, you know, am I qualified for this? Well, I, I've been asked to do it, so I'm going to do it, you know, and I, I got a PhD. I know I understand the scientific method, mm. you know. Uh, just because I don't have a degree in physical sciences doesn't mean I can't do this, right? This is my own sort of mindset. And so I go in knowing that nobody wants me there, <laughs> right? And actually, I even got a call. I mean, just like it was a day or so after I got a call from the Department of Commerce asking me to come and do it, I got a call. I left the voicemail, uh, fortunately, from a reporter saying, hey, Mr. Richwine, I want to know about this new job you got. You know, clearly, you know, hostile. So nobody wants me there. There's this... Um, pre-scheduled all staff meeting, not not about me, but just because they have all staff meetings, and it's one of those. It was one of those, uh, uh, you know, virtual ones, and you participants can ask questions, right? Mm -hmm. And and they can ask them anonymously, and then the director will answer them and so on. I sat there counting the first time. There were fifteen about me, <laughs> and I'm watching, and, and and everybody can see these questions, right? And they're all along the lines of. Um, I don't feel safe here yeah. with Jason Richwine in charge. You know, I, I, I'm worried about the immigrants here who work at NIST. You know, what's going to happen to them? <laughs> I'm trying to, like, what do these people think I'm going to do to them? I, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I tried to make my mark as best I could. And as I said, I, I, I have uh, hope for the future if we can get the right people in right away. But I, I would say that um, in talking about this, I hope that I'm at least to some small degree an inspiration in the sense that I'm still here. You know, maybe I'm not as prominent as I should be uh, or as I want to be, but I'm still doing this. You know, I I, I never groveled, right? I never apologized. Mm -hmm. um, then there were people who wanted me to. I said, no, I'm not doing that. No, the, one, the one thing I have left, you know, is is my my character. I am not going to compromise that. And I, I wrote several pieces. I think my favorite one was in Politico, because I wanted to get a piece responding to the firestorm 
in a place where someone other than conservatives would read. And mm-hmm. Politico ran it uh, to their credit. I'm very proud of it. Um, and again, um, I think there were a lot of people who wanted me to go away on the left and the right, who just slink away, you know, forget you existed. Sorry, nope, I'm here. And, yeah. you know, you got to deal with it because uh, the cancellation, I think, in the end, you know, did not work. Part of the reason it's so enraging is because you are not your replacement rate conservative scholar who, you know, theoretically has an issue area specification, but doesn't really know anything about it. And is just sort of sitting around writing, quote unquote, white papers that are more like 600 word op eds about how the, you know, well, I, I studied the stone tablets of conservatism and it says we should cut taxes. And so that's the answer. Like you are an right. actual scholar with actual deep expertise, original uh, research under your belt and and an obsession with a core issue of public policy, which is what I think the best policy scholars have. And I I can I can name the total amount of people in Washington who fit that description on the right of center on two hands. Um, so it's extremely frustrating um, that this happened. But um, enough about that. You, di- you did bounce back. You're, you're at Center for Immigration Studies now, um, and you're putting out fantastic content every single day. Um, and so we should we should talk about that. What 10,000 um, foot view? What is the state of American immigration right now? Oh, boy, Sir Rob, um, it is uh, very bad. It's very bad. And I, to be honest, again, remember, I mentioned I'm naive. I, I knew that the Biden administration would loosen the rules for sure. I did not think it would be to this degree. Uh, the southern border situation is a, at a point of lawlessness that goes beyond what it's ever been in the past. And this is just the the illegal part. We can talk about the legal part as well. But the southern border, I, there are so many people I talk to, including conservatives, who think that the problem with the southern border is that the Biden administration is just not doing a good enough job preventing people from crossing. And they're the kind of people who think, you know, if only we had drones on the border, and then, then we could solve because they would find them and then we yeah. could stop them. If only we had a more smart personnel. Border. That's yeah. right. That's right. But that's not the problem. The, the problem is the Biden administration is facilitating illegal immigration. So many people don't understand that. Uh, that's what's happening. And, and it started with the administration removing the key deterrence that the Trump administration had put in place, took a long time. There was a lot of blood, sweat, and tears in that Department of Homeland Security during the Trump administration, but they managed to do it. They managed to get the border under control. One of the key ways they did it was through reform of asylum. They said, you can't just declare that you're applying for asylum and then come into the country because you could just disappear and they'll never see you again. Your your ticket in the country is just to say, hi, I apply for asylum. No, you have to wait in Mexico while we adjudicate your claim. And when that happened, much of the flow dried up because they realized that uh, for, the, for the most part, I would guess something like 90% don't have a legitimate asylum claim. They're economic migrants, right? Traditionally, we don't give asylum to economic migrants. We give it to people who are being oppressed for their religion or something like that. And so that's right up. One of the first things that Biden did, in fact, he promised to do this as a candidate, and was to move against that remaining Mexico policy. And lo and behold, actually, even before he took office, a new surge was coming because they knew the rules were going to be uh, lax. This was had to be foreseen. I mean, I can't say for sure it was intentional in the sense that the ha ha ha, this is a, you know, our master evil plan. But surely they had foreseen what would happen once you get rid of that deterrent at the border. But it goes beyond that. Um, let me say that parole is one of the biggest ways in which they manipulate the immigration system. So what is parole? In the Immigration and Nationality Act, there's a provision that says that uh, the secretary can allow an otherwise inadmissible migrant to come in if there is a significant public benefit uh, on a case-by-case basis uh, or or a, a significant humanitarian issue. This was always intended to be an exceptional circumstance for an individual immigrant. You know, he needs to visit his sick mother in the hospital or something like that. What the Biden administration has turned this into is that it reserves the right to admit any number of immigrants at once for any reason at any time. And that's what it's doing. And, and in fact, it even has that, that CBP-1 app on your you can get on your phone, you download it, and you can schedule your illegal entry. Right. You don't have a visa, but you can schedule it. You can show up there and they say, OK, uh, you know, are you here for a humanitarian reason? OK, well, come on in. Uh, that's the situation we're in right now. 
And to me, I mean, I don't think it's an exaggeration to say that it really does threaten our democracy. I mean, we hear that phrase a lot, but if you're going to so fundamentally change the United States without legal, legal authorization, then that really is a blow to what we call representative government. Yeah. Um, asylum law is a very interesting thing because I, I think it's, it is the tail wagging the dog on so much of the crisis at the border. I think, I think people assume, you know, it's as simple as, um, you know, again, putting some of these physical barriers in place for this technology in place. But in reality, it seems to be the, the rotten fruit of, of the international order that allows for the United States to be taken advantage of in this way. How would you go about reforming asylum law to prevent this kind of thing from happening? Well, for one thing, the the whole the whole treaty uh, I think needs to be probably junked uh, and replaced with something that can't be so easily abused. It's it's unfortunate, you know, and that we have certain provisions that are meant to be exceptional, and asylum is one of them. Where you know there, there really should not be very many asylees right coming to the United States in the Western Hemisphere. We just don't really have that kind of of um, sort of oppression on a group level and such that goes on here that, that would generate a lot of asylees coming. We want to be generous. We want to be have a program that says, okay, if you really are a genuine uh, asylum seeker or you know, have a, a genuine claim, you should be able to come. But what happens is it gets abused. It gets it gets thoroughly abused. It's the same with the parole program. I can I can understand wanting to have a parole provision that says you can come visit your sick mother in the hospital for, for six weeks or whatever. But if it's going to be abused like this, I think ultimately we just can't have that provision. Uh, you know, regarding asylum too, I mean, it's, what's happening is people are, you know, coming to say Brazil and they may come from Africa. They get to Brazil and they're living there for a while. But then the, the point is to sort of make the journey up and they go through a bunch of other countries and eventually they get to the U.S. border. They say, I'm applying for asylum. And the most obvious thing to say is, well, you know, from what country, <laughs> right? And it was, you went through so many other countries first. I mean, one of the basic principles of asylum is you're not there. You don't shop around for your country of, you know, of, of, of refuge, right? You just go to the first place you're safe. And the response from the pro-immigration side is nowhere is safe. Everything south of the border. <laughs> That's what they say, right? I mean, you know, no, you know, you know, if if Guatemala is too dangerous, there's gangs everywhere, right? Uh, then, no, sorry, Honduras is, is also completely dangerous. Mexico too dangerous. Every country is dangerous, except the United States. And that's why we have to go to the United States. So I think one of the most basic principles to be enforced is if you travel through a, a third country to get here, then your asylum claim is automatically uh, in, invalid. And and how much of an agent in this process are those intermediary countries? Do they not want these people? And so they're kind of shoving them along yes, the chain? Yes. It's just, let's push you, keep pushing you, uh, you know, up the chain, right? Mm -hmm. And under the Trump administration, they tried to sort of reverse that process. They What what they tried to do, which is the right thing to do, is try to get each country to be a block, mm -hmm. right? And you can do that, you know, through various carrot and sticks approach, you know, which I think, I think they did reasonably well, you know, give Mexico the incentive and also sort of a threat to say, hey, make sure they get stopped at, at your border, your southern border, mm -hmm. so they don't come to ours. Which is much more defensible than our southern border. Uh, I suppose it is. Like it is it's, a lot, it's a bit shorter. It's, it's yeah, a little yeah. bit shorter. <laughs> yeah, it's like a little isthmus and, you right, know, right. it's just not at the northern edge. Yeah. Um, one of the proposals that has been floating around uh, the center right for decades at this point is is e verify, mm -hmm. um, and it's kind of stalled out for a long time as a, as a really salient active proposal. It's one of those things that you know candidates say we need to implement mandatory e verify, but it's just it's become like a meme. It's like the flat tax, um, and then someone went and did it. Governor DeSantis passed mm -hmm. mandatory e verify in Florida. Uh, it was a couple months ago. What's been the result? You know, give me the, the fresh off the press's takes on on what's going on in Florida because they implemented it. Yes, I agree. E-Verify is one of the key components to uh, immigration enforcement internally, right? Uh, but enforcement is the key, right? Mm -hmm. You can pass a law that looks great, but if you don't have someone actively enforcing those laws, what happens is businesses quickly realize they're not really enforcing this. You know, and so can you talk about what the enforcement looks like, um, practically speaking? Well, I mean, the rule, of course, what you know, what you verify actually is, it says that that uh, for whatever workers are covered, right, and you'd hope it to be universal, but it's not always uh, that they that each time 
an employer hires a new worker that they have to put uh, their ID through this online system run by the government called E-Verify. And in most cases, almost all cases, it comes back really quickly to say whether that person is work authorized or not. Now, the problem is that uh, you have to make sure they actually are running them through E-Verify. And in addition to that, you have to make sure or have some kind of way of preventing uh, just uh, identity theft, right? Uh, a lot of people don't realize that the current rule for uh, I-9s, you know, that form you have to fill out when, you're, when you get hired. This was the, uh, I think, from 86, when they passed that amnesty, the, the compromise was, well, from now on, we'll make it illegal to hire illegal workers. Uh, those don't go to the government. A lot of people think they do. You know, you fill that out, okay, we'll send this to the IRS. No, you just keep it at your, at your workplace. And theoretically, someone could come and ask to see it. Like that That's the enforcement. So you, can, you would think E-Verify would be a pretty important thing. Anyway, uh, enforcement is the key uh, and coverage is the key. So what's happened in some other states is like Arizona. Uh, initially, there did seem to be a pretty significant effect, but it kind of trailed off. And I, I can't say for sure. I'm not studying Arizona in depth. But my sense is that, you know, if you're not really uh, enforcing it as, in, as vigilant a way as possible, uh, people might start coming up with ways around it. So it'd be interesting to see what happens in Florida. We're at that stage right now where employers are kind of scared of it. And you know now we at least see stories, at least claiming that they're unable to hire new workers and such. Uh, we'll see if that continues, if that if the state administration is willing to, to uh, check on that. Now, another thing to keep in mind with that law is that it's a great law. I'm glad they got it passed. Uh, it's not as good as it could have been and I don't blame the governor on this, I blame the legislature, uh, that, it, in, that it doesn't cover all workers. Uh, I, I actually I forget the size now, uh, but it only covers workers uh, who employed in businesses of a certain size and greater. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we did an analysis of this for CIS, you know, and found that, uh, you know, a, a lot of illegal workers work for small companies. And so they're already, uh, you know, uh, immune to this. And so, and there's a game you could probably play with subcontractors and stuff, or even large companies could uh, get away with taking advantage of the labor, right? Yes, that's another thing that they will do uh, a lot of the time. And so, again, vigilance is the key, you know, and also universality. And so, a great step. I would love to see another piece of legislation that makes it truly universal in Florida. But uh, I will say, given the situation in Florida with the Republican supermajorities, the fact that the legislature was still not able or not willing to pass the universal one does speak to the fact that there are still a significant number of Republicans who will say they're opposed to illegal immigration, but when it actually comes to removing the incentive for them to be here, suddenly they back off and say, well, I didn't think you actually meant have them leave the country. Mm -hmm. That's a problem. I and mean, that's a problem we have to fight against. What would an an enforcement regime actually look like? Would it look like, you know, random checks by the government on on employers, you know, making sure that every single person working at an establishment is is being run through the system? I mean, I, I think it's valuable to get down to brass tacks because mm -hmm. again, that's that's where the, the slippage occurs and, and where you could easily see our, you know, Republicans get the political credit for passing something, but ultimately mm -hmm. none of the societal upshot being preserved if if the enforcement's not right yes um, and so those details i unfortunately can't tell you uh in in uh, uh a lot of them because um it's not the area i typically work in but uh the enforcement definitely has to involve that first of all if you if you have a, a, a no match situation you send the letter right you know sorry this you know the these credentials don't match you know uh who we think this person is you send the letter <laughs> the minimum you have to follow up on that. And, you, know, you, you don't know what's going on here. Right? I, I would also say that one idea which would require legislation is to do a kind of, um, to empower individuals to file lawsuits related to this. You know, that if you're, if you're a worker, especially at a, at a place where someone who's obviously illegal has been hired beside you, uh, you that's a kind of knowledge you might be able to use and saying, hey, wait a minute, this is, you know, this is, he's under my wage. And, you know, if, if you had uh, an ability to sue over that, that could also. Yeah, creating improve. private rights of action. Yes. The same thing we did with abortion in Texas. So we should do it with, yeah, I mean, I, I'm, I'm pro that. I think we should right. dramatically expand the conservative plaintiff's bar to do this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. I think that's fantastic. Um, 
We recently had on Oren Cass uh, to talk extensively about immigration. He had this fantastic piece that I encourage everyone to read, you know, Jobs Americans Won't Do, which was sort of the top to bottom materialist case against mass migration, you know, talking about just the economic consequences that Americans face because of it. Um, I think that's all fantastic and it's a valuable point. But it's very clear that one thing that conservatives tend to be uncomfortable talking about uh, is the cultural impacts of immigration. Mm -hmm. uh, it's something that your scholarship has focused extensively on. Um, and I think it's worth digging into here. Let's start with illegal. What have the cultural consequences of mass illegal migration to the United States been over the last 40 years? Largely the same as the, the consequences of legal immigration. I mean, it, it's uh, when you talk about broad cultural trends, um, the, the fact is that a country is defined by its people and their culture. I mean, it sounds so obvious when you put it that way, right? But in the immigration context, it's so often it gets kind of lost and, and it gets lost in sort of like, you know, these this Ellis Island mythology that people love to fall back on. The, the idea that, well, sure, people are different when they come, but they assimilate, you know, they, they just, they turn into Americans. They, they become clones almost of, of the people who are here, but it's just obviously not the case. And if we could get people to talk about this more, I, I think that uh, we would have a much more rational discussion of immigration in general. You know, there's this thing I call uh, the Irish retort. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with that. The Irish and the Italians assimilated. Why? Why? Why can't? Yes, you know, exactly. New ethnicity. Right. Yeah. And and it's the cyclical nativism that people allege. Right. It's that you know people used to say this about the Irish. Right. People used to say about this about the Italians. They turned out fine. And so today's immigrants, they'll also be fine. There's a couple of different ways to respond to that, right? I mean, one is to say, well, the times are different now. We're less focused on assimilation. We're less pro-American, which is fine. But the other point is that the Irish and the Italians did change America. I'm not saying it necessarily for the bad. For the bad. It might be maybe in some ways for the good as well. Uh, but every group changes America in some way. Uh, they don't just become clones of um, the people who are here. Uh, there's lots of evidence about that. Uh, and one of my favorite books on this topic uh, was by the economist Garrett Jones called The Culture Transplant. came out uh, just last fall. It's a topic that has long fascinated me. And, you know, he wrote uh, about the economic uh, studies of this in a way that was much better than I could. And uh, what he shows basically is that if you want to predict how prosperous a country is today uh, and you want to look from the past, right, to make that prediction, you don't focus on the place, right? If you, if you looked at North America in the year 1500, you wouldn't say, wow, this place is ripe for being the richest country in the world, uh, you know, in the year 2000 or whatever. You look at the people, right? You look at the history of the people. So you look at the people who are here now and what is their history? Where did they come from? What kinds of accomplishments do they have? And what was their level of technological sophistication, their level of um, uh, sort of creating efficient states that didn't just you know, sort of steal the property from people, uh, their uh, history of agriculture. If you look at that, then you can make these sort of amazing predictions about which countries are going to be rich and which are going to be poor today. So again, it's the people that matter. And there's so much additional evidence of that outside of the economics literature that I personally find fascinating. Uh, this is a good timing because uh, just today I have a new academic article uh, in economics letters is in, in press that went up today. And the, the finding itself is kind of simple, but I, I think points to sort of a fascinating uh, broader trend. Uh, we know that savings is an important component of an economy, right? People need to save money so that it can be invested and, and used for newer technologies and things. So you want people who have a sense of frugality. You don't want people just spending all their money immediately on frivolous things, right? So how persistent is savings behavior? And so I looked at uh, American data. I looked at second generation immigrants. This is the children of, of foreign born people, right? And I looked at their, their retirement savings as adults, because a lot of them are adults now, right? How much do they contribute to their retirement funds? I then correlated that with the national level savings rate of their ancestral country. So if you take uh, a Chinese, the son of a Chinese uh, uh, immigrant parents in the US, 
Uh, how much is he contributing to his retirement fund? How does that compare to the, the national savings rate in China? What you find is a pretty strong correlation that that the the higher national savings rate, the more the children of immigrants in the U.S. will save their money. And this is income agnostic. This is at every stage of the yes. income. And so you can do a simple bivariate correlation, mm -hmm. right? Which is nice to make a nice little scatter plot that people enjoy. You put the best fit line in. But then what you can do is a regression analysis where you, you uh, control for everything you possibly can. Obviously, one of them is income, right? So yes, control for income, control for education, control for, uh, for sex and for employment levels and such. You still see this this phenomenon going on now why is that happening the answer it, it's it's cultural persistence and you see it in so many other ways i was motivated to do that paper because of so many uh papers on social trust just this basic question how much do you trust your neighbors right how much can you trust people in general uh, it was back in the 90s when a paper on this was written that found that same kind of correlation that i described that you can take the trust level of americans today and then look at the trust level of, of countries of the world today, and then they line up remarkably well. And that paper was on European Americans only. Okay, so this is not, as some, people, some people think, oh, this is a racial thing. No, it's much more fine grained than that. And so in the United States, uh, Swedish Americans tend to have a greater civic culture that tend to have more social trust than say Italian Americans. Just like in Europe, Swedes have a greater civic culture and uh, more social trust than Italians in Europe. All that stuff is still around to this day. And once you see that, you realize, you know, immigration doesn't cause assimilation. Immigration causes uh, a culture transplant, just as, as Garrett Jones described. It's really remarkable. I think that's fascinating because, you know, I think in a lot of discussions about immigration and culture, mass migration uh, proponents will often um, lean on, um, you know, the idea that, you know, oh, you, you know, you, you don't have rigorous data showing these these social consequences and economics is like language. It can be used to lie. Um, and mm -hmm. so uh, the, the, the economic stuff doesn't land. But like, what are some other sort of systematically rigorous ways that one can analyze something that can seem nebulous like culture? Mm -hmm with regards to immigration? Well, uh, let me give you an example of another paper, uh, very recent, this actually post-dates uh, Garrett Jones's book. And it was kind of got some uh, some Twitter play. It, it was about how uh, white Southerners migrated out of the South after the Civil War and in the early part of the 20th century. Most people know about the great migration of, of Blacks, right, to the uh, Northeastern and Midwestern cities. But numerically speaking, there are actually more white Southerners who moved out than than blacks, not as a percentage, but um, as a total. And they did not go to the cities. They typically went to places like New Mexico, uh, Southern California, uh, Southern parts of Illinois, Indiana, and such. What these uh, researchers found when they analyzed this is that if you look at the percentage of migrant Southerners in a county in 1940, people would move from the old Confederacy to outside of it. Look at that percentage in 1940. It will predict things today, like how much that, that county supports Donald Trump, or how much they oppose abortion, or they build evangelical churches. And my favorite, favoring barbecue chicken over pizza. That was one of, <laughs> one of the things they found. And it's funny to see the reaction on the left to this paper, because you know, to them, white Southerners are like the root of all evil, mm -hmm. right? And and you can see them almost like, you know, really sort of clenching their fists and saying, I can't believe these people spread their ideology all around the country. You know, how unfortunate. And, you know, it, maybe it would have been better if they'd split off and, you know, they'd won the Civil War. You, all, people say crazy stuff on Twitter, right? Um, but then the obvious follow-up to that is, why is it that you can believe that about white Southerners, but you can't believe that immigrants from abroad don't bring their culture here as well and spread it here. Why is it you're going to assume that people from, you know, South Asia or Africa or uh, or Eastern Europe or whatever are going to come to the United States and just assimilate immediately? They're not going to do what white Southerners did. Of course they will. Of course they will. Yeah, that's fascinating. Um, is there a scientifically rigorous way to measure um, assimilation uh, in the form of, of sort of patriotism in immigrant populations? What, what, what is it that the social science tells you on, on that? Um, because again, one of the sort of um, 
wells that that pro-immigration people on the right tend to lean on is you know the the supposed extreme and and often implied even greater than natives patriotism of mm-hmm. immigrant populations how do social scientists think through that element well this is the the concept of patriotic assimilation mm-hmm. right it's it's the idea that one need not necessarily be fully culturally assimilated in the sense that they're indistinguishable from Americans but do they at least see themselves as Americans do they do they in the same way that that others do the natives do or the people with with a lot of um time spent in the US do and admittedly i mean that data is is not easy to, to come by um but my sense of it is that there is a kind of uh, hyphenated American uh, phenomenon that does seem to persist, especially among Latin Americans. You know where you know you know what what best defines you. You know uh, American, Hispanic American, Latino American, so on. Uh, there there is a large percentage. I don't have the data. They will say, well, it's you know it's Hispanic American. Um, and now, how important is that? It's hard to say. It's hard sometimes to to connect answers to survey questions with actual behavior. But uh, I do think it is certainly a cause for concern. And what's the time preference on this? Like, is is there a point? I, th- I think I think the the broader point about mm-hmm. say the savings data and stuff that you mentioned is that, you know, you could be two three generations in and you're still seeing attendant uh, residual effects from from previous cultural environments. Um, is there a point in the far future where that levels off and becomes indistinguishable? Does that necessarily require sort of literal like you know genetic uh, assimilation with the rest of the population. That mm-hmm. is to say, you know, people have married um, each other in the native population so much that it becomes hard to even tease out um, uh, a particular ethnic population. What, what, when, when, how long does it take to get to something that you would analyze as much closer to real assimilation? Well, a few things. One is remember, not all cultural traits are persistent. There are certain things that do seem to happen. Uh, to change fairly quickly. One of them uh, is a uh, role of the sexes. It's, it seems that even people who come from countries where there is uh, a big divide between male and female roles, that seems to change pretty quickly when they get to the United States and really to all Western countries. Yeah. So that's and I'm assuming this is more, you could apply this to sort of social conservative issues more broadly, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, this is this is the other cope that a lot of people have is well, golly gee, these these immigrants, they they believe there's two genders and, you know, they, they believe men are men and women are women and, you know, role for each in the home that, you know, how could you oppose this? And it's like, well, it's not entirely clear that any of that sticks around for very long. Uh, but yeah, that's true. And I believe me, I welcome uh, everyone I can find as allies on issues like like that one. Um, I, I do wish, though, that, you know, the way you really fight that kind of situ- uh, problem is you vote for the candidates who are against it. Mm-hmm. And it's one thing to protest uh, in Montgomery County, Maryland. That's great. I'm glad to see it. But who are they voting for? Are they going to vote for the Republicans who are against it or not? Yeah. And that's that's a problem. Anyway, back to the uh, generational thing. So there are others that seem to be very persistent, like the trust is one of them. The savings is another. How far does it go? Well, obviously, we are limited by our data. Some of the studies that Garrett Jones was able to look at actually do go to the fourth generation, and you still see this effect. So also keep in mind, that uh, in the study of European Americans, you know, their peak immigration was at, at, at least 100 years ago, and in some cases, for some groups, longer than that. So even though we can't distinguish third, fourth, and fifth, we just have sort of a three plus generation we're looking at. We have to know that many of them are fourth and fifth generation, mm-hmm. and are still showing this effect. And the other thing is, you know, we talk about what does that mean? If you answer a survey question about trust, why does that matter? You know, once you start thinking about the different groups who settled different parts of America, it's hard to ever stop thinking about it. It becomes almost like my favorite topic because you can see that, you know, parts settled by certain groups uh, just exhibit different uh, tendencies than others. Some of them are frankly just more prosperous. Some of them have much lower uh, illegitimate birth rates. Some of them have much higher levels of education and such. Uh, one of the groups that has struggled the most in in the United States is one of the earliest groups. Uh, it's uh, the borderer population, uh, Scotch Irish who live in sort of Appalachia area, and they, I think, actually have a lot of positive attributes in the sense that they were the ones who really 
uh, you know, pushed the frontier westward and and settled some pretty rough terrain and, you know, fought with the Indians and so on. I mean, they, they in some ways, they're, they're quintessential Americans. But it's also true that, you know, the stereotype about, uh, you know, the Hatfields and the McCoys and so on, you know, there's some truth to that stereotype. And, and they have struggled a lot, especially uh, in the second half of the 20th century. But you notice that where they go, you can trace where the struggles are. Like some people might say, well, why, why is it that the Ozarks seem to have such a similar culture to the Appalachians, uh, you know, in, in you know, Ohio, Tennessee and such, whereas it seems so different in the Rocky Mountains? Isn't this all, it's all a mountain culture, right? Well, because the same types of people settle the Ozarks as they did in, you know, southeastern Ohio and so on. And so uh, that fact explains a lot uh, about why the United States is the way it is today. There's a great book about that, Albion Seed. I strongly recommend people read that uh, by by uh, by Fisher. And you know he talks about all four of the major British settler groups, and you can see their their impact uh, all the way to today. You know, uh, one of my favorite examples actually is that in the 2000 census, the state with the highest reported population of English ancestry was um it's a tough one if you haven't heard it before i don't think i have <laughs> it's utah okay now why is that i mean th the reason is because most mormons the ones who made the trip were recruited from new england uh, in new england also some came from england uh to the u.s and they are yankees right a and some people say well, why is utah uh, you know, such a, a a strong state in terms of education and and marriage and low legitimacy, high rates of employment. And a lot of people point to Mormonism itself. It's a, it's a great religion. It really it encourages those things. But that interacts with the fact they're Yankees. Right? This is what Yankees do when they move to places, <laughs> right? That this is the kind of cultures they set up. They've always had that very highly civic culture, and it, it got sort of mixed in with Mormonism in Utah to create. Uh, what I think is sort of fascinating patterns across the United States. Very interesting. What um, what would you say is the major distinctions that can be delineated between the different waves of migration over the last hundred years, um, and those those social effects they have on the United States? Well, I mean that that's that's difficult. I would say actually that at first it seemed like a lot of the new immigration followed the old in the sense that they came to the parts of the United States that were culturally similar. This is a sort of a 19th century phenomenon. Um, so you had um, a lot of German immigration to places in the Midwest that had been initially settled by the Yankees. You know, Michigan is a good example of that, right? Wisconsin is another example, whereby they shared some cultural traits in terms of the civic identity and such that, that worked well. Um, an example of contrary to that, though, would be the Irish immigration to New England, right? And so Irish immigration was sort of our first kind of urban immigration. In fact, you might even call them our first immigrants in the sense that most of the uh, people who came here before were settlers, you know, coming to a new land. Uh, this was very much immigration in a modern sense, where they would come to pl places like Boston, uh, kind of a, a, a an early twentieth century kind of vibe to that, and with with a sufficient um, sort of throughput. That when they when they came and settled in those cities, they created sort of ethnically homogenous communities inside urban areas. You know, there the, there were there were there were areas that could be conceivably seen as, as primarily run by and 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 um occupied by this recent ethnic group that right I right and that's, that's what happened and that was certainly a uh a culture mm -hmm. clash for sure uh, between the irish catholics who were kind of rough and tumble especially uh coming from ireland which was you know had a, a major famine around that time compared to you know your sort of um you know, your blue blood wasps, you know, who were occupying that place for quite a long time. You know, we forget they first came in like the 1630s, mm -hmm. right? And that was the first major immigration to that area. So that was certainly a clash. Uh, you know, as time went on, I think that that the immigrant ways became more and more different. I mean, so by the late 19th century, we had a lot of Southern and Eastern European immigration. 
uh, quite varied in terms of its uh, economic uh, success. Some rather low skill groups like Italians, some quite high skill groups. Um, and then, of course, post-1965, I think in even more culturally distant you know, groups coming partly from Latin America and now increasingly from Asia. And so it, it's it's quite a mix. And I think, it, you know, the, the cultural clashes are, are inevitable. Um, and, and I also think that um, what we could do, I think, to make them as easy as possible is just to kind of turn down the heat by turning down the numbers. Mm -hmm. Immigration must be restricted in order to promote uh Cultural solidarity and the economic well-being of all Americans. That's how American Moments priority on the issue mm -hmm. is written. Um, one of the things that that I think about a lot is that it might well be possible um, to have a system where significant amounts of, of new migration and sort of cultural heterogeneity um, could work, but it but it would require a form of government that is very alien to the American experiment. Like Singapore seems to have found a way mm -hmm. to establish broad social stability, but it's also an extremely, extremely intrusive state. Um, and I and I say that in sort of a, a, a with, with no stink on it that that's the choice that that, mm -hmm. that regime has made, and it's it's an obviously successful one. But w what do you think about that? You know, looking at the comparative examples, there there are countries that have a similar or even greater level of cultural heterogeneity than the United States. Um, is there any way to calibrate a regime to account for that? I mean, to, to make, you know, to make it a, a strength, you know, diversity is our strength. I mean, <laughs> you know, that, that, that sounds very difficult to me. I'm not sure yeah. that any group has really managed to do, to do that. I mean, diversity of course has a lot of challenges associated with it. It often causes division and there's a huge literature on that question. Some of it ca covered by Garrett Jones. Um, I, I don't know. I mean, my, my sense is that living with the diversity that we have is going to require something I alluded to earlier in our talk, which is it's going to require that we live and let live on socioeconomic differences. You know, people talk about white black gaps ad nauseum. And yet, if you go to the census and you look at the ancestry of the household head and you sort by income, you know, average income by ancestry, right? You get a really long list, very long list of substantial gaps, right? Uh, including intra-European gaps. And I don't think most people would look at the gap between, you know, Indian household income, which happens to be, I believe, the highest income in the United States, and the gap between German Americans and say, well, the reason is Indians are oppressing the Germans in the United <laughs> States, right? No one would say that. Yeah. Right? And yet there are some gaps, obviously the white black one is one of them, in which people will say, well, there's 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 the proof right there. Justice Jackson said that in the affirmative action case in the Supreme Court. That was her, her argument was, let me tell you about socioeconomic gaps and therefore oppression is occurring. My point about the long list is to say that these differences can exist outside of an oppression structure. And yes, obviously there is a there is a terrible history between whites and blacks in the United States. It doesn't exist between Germans and Indians. But that doesn't mean that history is, you know, the causative agent here. And to assume it is, I think is is very damaging to our society. I hear the term merit-based immigration a lot in DC that, you know, even the um you know, uh, e even the the center of sort of mainstream immigration restriction that that is sort of the keystone proposal. Mm -hmm. um, is it as simple as you know only let in PhDs and everything will be fine? No. Um, a couple things about that. Uh, one is you know PhD is not a very good description of our so-called high skilled immigrants that we take today. I mean, I have actually several papers on this. The the relatively low value of the foreign degree, you know, where we get people uh, who have a college degree or a graduate degree from uh, outside the United States, outside of the English speaking world, really, that's the key thing. Uh, it just doesn't show up as valuable either in the measured skills, because we have some of that data, or in uh, income, right? And so that that's one thing that really to keep in mind that you know the H one B program that's the high skill program well, not really 
Mm -hmm. Not really. It's mostly just college graduates. Mm -hmm. Okay. So with PhDs, you know, you have to be careful, you know, it's a PhD in what and, and where. That's that's yeah. the other uh, important factor. The, the, the Botswana University PhD program is very different than you know yes. Xinhua, <laughs> right? And, and and I think part of it, and I don't, I don't mean to sort of denigrate other countries' educational systems. Part of it really is English. You know, uh, actually, uh, degrees from India are moderately valuable in the United States, not nearly as valuable as a from Canada or something. Mm -hmm. But I think because a lot of the universities are, are conducted in English in India, I believe, whereas others are not. And so that that's certainly an issue as well. But you know, we find that even after many years in the United States, presumably the chance to learn English and such, I just don't know that the skills necessarily transfer as much as you would hope mm -hmm. they would. So the better question I think is, you know, what about the really super smart people, the Einsteins? One point is that there actually aren't all that many Einsteins, like like genuine yeah. Einsteins in this world. We can't just say, yeah, we're going to take a million Einsteins a year. Yeah, it's not really the way the bell curve works. Yeah, right. Uh, yeah, if you, if you were to define mm -hmm. genius in a statistically rigorous way, what mm -hmm. would it be like? Fourth standard deviation IQ. Uh, I, I will so, so see. Genius is a loaded term. I, I I would say if you're just talking about someone of exceptional intelligence. Mm -hmm. I would say uh, three standard deviation, okay. you know, uh, which is like a 145 IQ. Yeah. Um, which is 0.4% or point, no, 0.1. Uh, 0.015. Yeah, 0. <laughs> 0.015. 0.015. Yeah. Yeah. Um, um, so even if you took that of the entire world, there's not a lot. It's not a lot. Right. And they have to be willing to come here. Yeah. They may not be, right? Yeah. So that, that's one thing. Uh, the other thing, so genius, genius is 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 uh, ability plus drive. Mm -hmm. It's uh, the kind of creativity that is difficult to measure. Mm -hmm. uh, you want people who are uh, willing to sort of go against the grain. And there's lots of interesting uh, Evo psych ideas about, you know, why is it that Western Europe in particular became so prosperous? And one of them is that maybe there's just this, this natural tendency they have to question everything, you know, mm -hmm. it's it's not to want to just fit in. That's the kind of you know genius. I I think probably is very valuable to a kind of community. And maybe you know the theory is, and it's just it's speculation really that maybe that's the reason why you know Western Europe traditionally you know has done better than a place like China, which has an extremely rich history and culture and such. But but you know but is it that they are just a little bit too conformist? Mm -hmm. Right. Interesting question. You know. And I, again, I think a. a a mass immigration of quasi high skill workers. Um, remember, you're 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 admitting more than just the college degree. Maybe you're admitting some of that conformity that maybe is not so important or so uh, so desirable. It's difficult to say. I, I don't want to go too far out of a limb here because the data on this are not strong. But this kind of thing you have to think about once you realize how important culture is. Yeah. One of the fights that we get in a lot with the pro-immigration crowd in DC is that it is sort of ahistorical or un-American to support immigration restriction. But the even most basically historically literate would know that we had a period of very low migration between 1924 and 1965. Mm -hmm. What happened in America sociologically in those years that that comes up in the the kind of research that you do about modern times? What what changed? Yeah, I mean, let me say, I mean, the idea that you know, America is a nation of immigrants, actually, it's funny, it was right around that time that that whole idea came about. You know, people didn't talk about nation of immigrants until around the time. Right around they, the time they were right. lobbying for the Hart Seller right. Immigration uh, uh, yes, Act. Yes, <laughs> yes, right. right. Um, it's much more accurate to, to describe the United States as a settler nation that has had some periods of high immigration. That's what it is. I mean, the, the idea that like the Scotch-Irish I've mentioned before, the idea that they're immigrants, I don't think so. I mean, they settled a, a wild frontier. They're settlers. Mm -hmm. and, and so are, I think are, are most of the original sort of British. Uh, they, they have more in common with a Russian who decides to homestead in Siberia than one who moves here now. Yes, right. Yeah. To, to, to an existing country yeah. that's fully established. And and again, I, I mentioned earlier that you know it was a good 200 years or so before New England had genuine immigration before, you know, after the Puritans arrived. Uh, so yes, uh, we've had periods of low immigration and periods of high immigration. One of those periods of low immigration was post-war. Uh, and it was a time, you know, coincidentally or not, where there was a fairly high degree of homogeneity culturally and even economically. This is a time when, uh, you know, incomes were rising faster for the low end than the high end. And uh, measures like social capital were, were especially high. Is that exactly because of low immigration? I, I can't prove that. I don't want to claim it's all due to that. But one would think it's involved. 
I, by the way, I want to admit um, my my ignorance on this one point regarding fertility during that time. Obviously, I knew there was a baby boom right around that time. Everybody knows that. But I thought that if you looked at a graph of fertility in the United States over time, I thought you'd see a bunch of booms like, oh, it kind of goes like this depending on the economy. No, I was totally wrong about that. It goes like this. It goes straight down. I mean, as I've seen data all the way back to 1800. You know, it starts at like seven children per, per woman. It just goes down and down and down and down and down, you know, linearly. You can see some economic effects like the Great Depression. It goes further, you know, it uh, declines faster, right? The, and then suddenly we have this baby boom, right? The baby boom is the only boom the United States has had as a country, which is amazing to me. I did not know that. And you know, maybe your listeners are thinking, oh, what an idiot. But I did not know that. And, and to me, the interesting question now is what made the baby boom happen? Not, not why is fertility declining? Because it's always been declining, except that period. And it, it must have been an amazing time to be in realizing that suddenly everyone wanted to have more children than they used to. And to me, like it has to be related to that kind of of uh, cultural homogeneity and the positive outlook, a, a sense that our country is going somewhere. You know, we're proud of our country, proud of our history, and we want to be a part of it, and we want to pass that on to our descendants. That kind of mindset makes for happy communities and for strong nations, and I feel like we've really lost that. Jason. Obviously, academia is not doing this kind of deep, interesting research, except in rare pockets like GMU um, and the work that you're doing. So how can people keep up with everything that you're writing about um, and how can they potentially reach out? Because I get the sense that a lot of people are going to be very curious to learn more after they hear this. Well, um, CIS.org is always a good place to visit. Uh, all of my CIS related work is there. Um, I do some other work. Um, I have a website. It's just jasonrichwine.com. I don't really update the blog part of it as much as I should, uh, but I do update the lists of my articles and op-eds and such. And so you can see all those there. I, I contribute to National Review from time to time. Uh, a lot of this stuff is on immigration because that's sort of my brief, uh, but I'll sometimes comment on, on other things. And um, hopefully I, I try for quality over quantity at NR. So hopefully others will agree if they go and read it. Fantastic. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast. It was my pleasure. It's funny, I got so wrapped up in sort of the emotional core of why I wanted to do this episode in the intro that I barely mentioned that Jason did have some other bylines in his career, namely that he served as the deputy director for the National Institute for Standards and Technologies during the Trump administration. He talked abstractly about the patriots in the fourth year of the Trump presidential personnel office who brought him in. Uh, these names are familiar to those of you listening to Moment of Truth, people like John McAtee and James Bacon, who deserve all the credit in the world for having the balls, frankly, to uh, help be part of uncanceling someone who's so unfairly maligned and canceled. Um, keep an eye on Jason's work. It is some of the most interesting stuff being thought and said on the issue of immigration. It's at CIS.org. You can follow everything else that we're doing here at American Moment at AmericanMoment.org. Uh, you can rate and review this podcast, five stars, on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. Subscribe to us on YouTube to be able to see uh, my pretty mug and Nick's and our guests. And you can follow us on Twitter at AMMoment.org, where we put out clips of every show uh, that you can share with your friends, enemies, allies, and more. Thank you guys, as always, for listening. We'll see you next week. Moment of Truth is an American Moment Studios production filmed at the Conservative Partnership Center. Our podcast is produced and edited by Jake Mercier and Jared Cummings. Our intro music is A Minor Struggle by Ryan Serenich. Don't forget to like and subscribe on all platforms, and you can go to AmericanMoment.org to learn more. Moment of Truth.